to be a test lead or a leader in testing. Um, the fact, you know, when we look at the test manager before, it's about control. It's about keeping things consistent. It's about um, making sure things are done towards the schedule. But a leadership is someone different. A leadership is about looking at outcomes. Leadership is about saying, this is what we want to achieve, but our team, it's up to our team to figure out how to get there. And so the role changes very differently from that of command and control to one of servant leadership, which I'm sure you've all heard about. Okay, so what are the elements here that are in test leadership? What are the things we should be looking at if we want to aspire to be test leaders? And we really, there's a huge name for test leaders in the software testing industry. Just think about it. Just think about who is making decisions about testing at the moment. It's rarely the testers, right? It's the de delivery leads, or it's the developers, or it's, um, you know, it's many other people who are making decisions about what testing should or should not be. Or even in DevOps, there's lots of technical people saying this is how we should be doing testing. I think that's really interesting because the people with the most experience in testing are not sitting at the table having those conversations with other people. I think we need to move to a future where we have test leadership contributing to those conversations. So it's up to us as testers and test managers and test leads to step up to that, to step up and be there at the table and have those conversations. But we have to understand how we're going to change ourselves. How are we going to be different? How are we going to get a place on that table? And, and this requires us to look at, at, leadership, uh, at what we do in a different way. The first thing that I've looked at is having a vision. And even within your organization, what is your vision for your testing in your organization? What do you want it to be? You know? Um, yeah, sure, you might, be, um, you, know, you might be looking at lots of different things. I bet there's lots of different things happening within your organization. Do you have visibility of those? Do you have a way of actually bringing yourself into those? Do you have an idea how you can contribute as a test manager, how you can contribute to your, business to your company's business outcomes? Do you even know what your company's business outcomes are? So these are the sorts of things you need to be start thinking about. What is the vision of my company and how can I align my, test, my testing with that vision? Okay, so I've, there's, there's, there's some things that help. It's not all up to us. Um, but there are companies out there who are already making these sorts of changes within their organizations. And we're, you're probably familiar with quite a few of them. So the, Atlast, the Atlassian, Atlassian Quality Assistance Model, right? This is where the developers do all the testing, right? There is no tester in Atlassian, right? That's very scary for a lot of us in this room. <laughs> um, but you need to, what I've done is, is, is to look at that model and say, okay, how can I, as someone, as a, as a person in testing, how can I contribute to that? Where do I play a part? Where does testing and my expertise play a part in that model? And how can I contribute to that model? So the other one is Google. We all hear about software developers in test. Again, there's no mention of testers in that model. So what is it about your personal capabilities? Is there somewhere that you can see, if your organization is thinking of going there, how do you play a part in that? You know, a lot of testers will go, oh, I'm not technical. I don't have a place in that. But what I'm seeing is that we're having two different types of testing evolve at the moment. Sure, there's emphasis on the technical side, working with engineers in a very technical manner. But there's also a, a great need for analysts and user experience and being able to understand business process. So one of the things that people forget when they look to Google, they look to Facebook, is that these are tech companies. They're not companies that have a business per se. So they're not a bank. The bank's predominant business is banking. It's not technology, right? So if you're working in an industry that is not a tech industry, then a, a, a tech company, there's a huge need to bring that business understanding into technology. And I believe testers and, business, and, and analysts play a huge part in that. So maybe that's something that can be looked at. 
eBay have a huge focus of embedded testers into their team, but they do it in the sense of automation, right? Test automation. Um, something that I'm a bit biased because I worked with this and I worked at Tyra Payments, which is a, a fintech uh, disruptor in Sydney. And we put embedded exploratory testers into each team. So we had, and the developers did all the automation. So we had a slightly different model. But look to what your, your company is. Look to your company's vision, your company's understanding of, of values. I'm sure each company has a, a, a statement or a vision about who they are. You know, take that and see if you can create a strategy and a vision around those. Okay, big thing is lots of people starting to look at quality, right? There's a lot more emphasis on quality rather than testing. Um, and I think to some degree you can understand why. People are looking at agile teams, they're saying quality is everyone's responsibility, right? So what does that mean in real terms? I think one of the big things is that we have to understand what quality is. People are throwing this word around everywhere and saying this is quality, but everyone has a different idea of what quality is. So we need to bring those conversations back and start asking our organizations, well, what do you mean by quality? You know, I love this definition by Jerry Weinberg because it's subjective. Um, so if, if quality is valued to, some, to a person, well, who are the people who matter in your organization? Because really, you should be listening to them and asking them what their thoughts on quality is, and then working your strategy around that. Also, what do they value? What is important to them? This will help shape what quality means. And it stops a lot of, and you, you know, it's really interesting when you, have, when you start these conversations, there's lots of different conflicting ideas about what quality is. But it's important to have that understanding. How can you build quality in if you don't even know what, you, what quality is for you and your organization? Okay, we need to look at strategies. These are some of the strategies that I've been working on. Um, as we're shifting to this sort of more quality-minded set, quality idea of quality, um, we're looking at doing testing in lots and lots of different ways, not necessarily performing testing on its own. So testing being an activity that potentially everyone is doing in a team. Um, so we're looking at different things. We're looking at different strategies and the thing that drives me when I look at strategies for testing within the organization is how can I identify what's risky, what is stopping us deploying at pace, what is preventing us from deploying smoothly, what are causing blockers, right? So if my test environment is taking me a day to set up, that's a problem. If my build speed is too slow, and I have developers sitting there for four hours drumming their fingers because they're waiting for the build to complete, that's a problem. So the types of problems that in testing that I'm looking at aren't necessarily only to do with the product anymore. They're to do with how can I help the organization move to deploy at pace, not at speed, because we know when we go at speed we make mistakes. We want to go at pace, a nice consistent pace throughout our deployment um, process. Also understanding from an ops perspective, and I think this is a huge part that testing and testers can play, because developers um, are fantastic at deploying, so they do product really well, but often the deployment of the product, we all know that can be a huge nightmare. And you know, I've been, when I was working looking at the microservices industry, um, and maybe, maybe some of you are on that journey already. Um, microservices, easy to create, nine, nice tiny little isolated um, components with bounded context. If you have to deploy 80 of those, that's a different story. <laughs> if you have to configure 80 of those before you can test it, that's a different story. If you have to set up security tokens for 80 different microservices, that's potentially a huge problem, right? So it's looking at these sorts of things and helping feed that information back into the cycle. And ops are going to be with you because they have to deploy in production. And if you have to manu manually configure 80 times, there's a chance that something's going to go wrong. Somebody's going to make a mistake. So getting working with ops and helping them to bring that information and helping that whole DevOps culture build, you can play a huge part in that. 
Um, also looking at performance testing, security testing, how can we build these in from day one? Right? How can we help the developers get feedback on things like performance before we have to wait for a performance testing phase right at the end? So that when we come to do maybe some performance testing, it's not a discovery phase, it's a more of a compliance phase. We want to be finding out this information as soon as we can. Okay, very similar, the embedded tester doing lots and lots of different activities. Um, feel free to take photographs because I, I will be actually flicking, starting to flick through these slides really pretty rapidly. Um, so, um, yeah, so, so the role of the tester, again, not necessarily only testing, but doing a lot, a lot of different things. One of the things I've seen testers do really well is have information. And many of you who are in testing will know this that you become the source of information in your organization because you know stuff. <laughs> You've had to set it up, so you know how to configure it. And often it's testers in small organizations are the ones who do um, demonstrations to customers. Why? Because the customer, because the tester knows what not to do, <laughs> right, <laughs> in front of the customer. So, you know, there's, we have to expand on that. We, you know, the, the value that we add, we have to be able to give that out and help people understand what value we do. And that, we have to get better at being able to verbalize that, enunciate that to other people. And we're not so good at that. That's something that we all have to work on. But it's doable. We can all do it. Um, so just to summarize sort of strategies in a very loose way, I think one of the big things is that in the old days, in the old bad waterfall days, you know, um, it was very much setting up the test strategy from day one. I mean, let's write it off, let's sign it off, and thou shalt not change. And if you change my test strategy, I will make you do another change request and I will make you sign it off, right? And this has caused massive problems for us all. We all hate it. Let's face it, it's horrible, it slows things down. So, but now we need to learn to pivot on new information. Pivot when we see risk, and we're all good at that in testing, when we see risk that we verbalize it, we conduct little experiments to help create evidence that there is a potential problem here. And then we share that information with the rest of the team. And you know what? Developers who see evidence, they love it. They jump on it and they start doing, trying to solve the problem themselves. So, so really changing how we think about our role in the organization. Being open to experimentation, trying out new things, doing little mini experiments. You might have an organization that, ooh, I don't know if we could do that, you know, the cost of it. Make it small, make it easy that, it, that your, your business doesn't have a huge, um, it's not a huge risk to your business. Make it as easy as possible for them to allow you to perform those experiments. Um, and finally, it's about driving the decision making down. It's not all about the test lead or the, the senior tester. It's about enabling everyone in testing who are, who are testers to make decisions. One of the things I love is, is testers who come up with an idea and arranging them to conduct a small experiment and there them trying out something and giving people the space um, to be able to conduct those experiments. Uh, and that way, it's a, so much less effort on you, <laughs> trust me. If you make everyone, if you make yourself the sole, sole point of decision making, I don't know about you, but you know, your hair starts falling out and you start kind of twitching a bit and you know, you run around stressed the whole time because you've got so much to do. You've got so much to do because you're holding it on to it all. So have a think about that. Big thing here we're talking about is motivation. You might be saying, oh, well, that's OK for you, Anne-Marie. You work in this fintech organization where everybody has the freedom to do things. It's not like that in my organization. I get that. But I think one of the core things that we can look at is our, the motivation. And there is intrinsic motivation and extrinsic. Right? We all know the whole thing about people, you, um, if you, if you encourage people through awards or pay rise, that gets you to some point. But you know the person on your team who is intrinsically motivated. They're, they're, they're amazing, isn't it, to have someone like that. It's their desire to do well. 
So we want to be able to tap into that. And we want to be able to understand how people work and what type of people that you're working with. Because if you start trying to understand the people that you work with, you'll be able to tap into their motivation. And that means stop, stopping taking a step back and actually listening to people, right? rather than rushing around and doing. Now, I am the number one worst rusher around to doer person. So this was really hard for me. And I had to constantly remind myself to take a step back and just make myself available. That's really hard for a lot of us. So here's Jimmy. Jimmy, I like to, I like to describe this. This is my, the coaching model. I started working on this with James Bach a while ago. Um, but really, it's looking at a model of how can we coach skill? How can we help testers or developers now or anyone who doesn't do testing to do testing well? Not brilliantly, because a tester, really, if a tester is doing testing all day, they should be good at it. That's what they do every day. They're, they're, they're teaching them smells, themselves to smell risk from, you know, they can smell it a mile off, right? Oh, I smell a bug over there, right? So, so, you know, the, the testing, um, but we can, we can train other people to test, yeah? And we can train them to test well. Um, and so there's a model that we've been working on where um, we, we help uh, testers and non-testers to become better at what they do. And this, the essence of this is doing it through a task. Now, this is actually a photograph of um, a, these... They're Scottish, by the way. You can tell by their kilts. That gives it's a bit of a giveaway. But in the Scottish Highlands, every summer, there is a competition between six villages. And they do all these manly things, you know, like tossing cabers and, you know. And this is one of the, one of the competitions. And the competition is to carry these enormous heavy logs 300 meters. They're not allowed to drop them. If they drop them, they have to go back and start again. And you can see from Jimmy's face, I don't know, he's either concentrating really, really hard or he's in absolute agony. I'm not sure which, but you can take your pick. But I love Bruce. Bruce is there. He's relaxed. See his shoulders. He's not going, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? He's relaxed. He's encouraging. He's supporting. He's helping the person win the race. And if Jimmy, we never know if Jimmy gets to the end of the line or not, but if Jimmy got to the end of the line, how do you think he'd feel? Yeah, did it. Right? The sense of achievement that he got from getting over the line in that competition, he'd feel great. And that's what we want to do in coaching. That's the outcome we want when we coach someone. We want them to walk away feeling, yeah, I love my job. <laughs> yeah, I can test well. Yeah, I've got this. Right? So how do we help them? One of the things we do is we give them a task. Now, we want the task to be something that is slightly out of their comfort zone. We don't, because how are they going to learn something new if it's not out of the comfort zone? Slightly out of the comfort zone and letting them do the work. Bruce here, Bruce isn't doing the job. <laughs> Jimmy's doing all the work. Bruce is there to support him. Maybe he's giving some tips. Relax the shoulders, Jimmy. You can do it. Or, um, you know, just keep those elbows bent. Don't forget, you know, keep moving forward. Something like that. So this is what we've got to do in coaching. We give the task, but also we, we help the person by giving them feedback as that task is going on. And that way, we can help the, the tester or the developer or whoever learn something new. So it's through feedback that we help um, the, the, the student acquire a new skill. OK, so just lots and lots of different possible tasks that could be done. I love this quote. It's one of my favorite quotes. And it was a huge insight for me um, to learn this. I had been um, in a sort of, I guess, overseeing. Um, a I was in a test lead role. And I went to this conference with David Marquet. He was talking about he's um, turning the ship around. And he was talking about what leadership is and how he had basically turned, he was captain of a nuclear submarine. And he actually turned the, um, 
the, the, you can imagine how hard this was in the military. Um, but he turned it in from a command and control to, to a flat decision-making structure. So if anyone's interested in this type of leadership, I highly recommend you read his book. Um, but this is one of the quotes that I, I was researching, and, I, and I, he used this quote once. And it's about providing people who you coach the space. Stop trying to fix people per se, but give them the space to learn. And that's all going back to that stepping back, right? Making yourself available, being there for people to come up to you. If you walk around rushed all the time, no one's going to want to come near you because you're so busy I can't disturb you. So we have to get better at, at becoming available. Now there's one thing that you might be thinking here. <laughs> But if I let everyone go around and do what they want, they're going to do what they want. <laughs> yeah, that's really quite difficult, isn't it? Um, and you have to learn to kind of, in a way, let go. And, and I guess some, to some degree, this is why the coaching as well comes in. It's having that constant feedback. But you have to be prepared that if someone, if you give people decisions and allow them to make decisions, sometimes they're going to make mistakes. And that's got to be okay. We can't start punishing people, we can't give people autonomy to make decisions and then when they do something wrong, punish them for it. Because you know, they're not going to make, they're not going to put their hand up and give you those new ideas if, if you don't, if you do that. So trying to provide a safe environment for people where they can learn and make, make uh, mistakes in a safe environment. That's not going to have a huge impact on your business, obviously. Um, Another way that we can help people through this, though, is through alignment. I, I talked at the start about having outcomes. You know, talking to, your, to the people that you work with about what are the outcomes that we want to achieve. Do you actually know even what the outcomes you want? You know, that's an interesting exercise in itself. But what are the, what are the outcomes that we want for our business organization? And then helping the team to come up with how to get there. It's not up to us anymore to make decisions about how those outcomes are going to be done. We want to engage our teams, we want to engage our testers and developers, and being able to look at those problems and be able to solve those problems. We all know how fun it is to solve a problem, right? We love it. So why don't we let our teams have that joy as well and feel engaged and feel part of the whole process. Okay, so these are some of the things that I did that I've helped, that I've found that are useful. Who doesn't love Slack, right? Um, Slack is a great way, or any communication method that you have within your organization. Building little channels, I'm sure you, a lot of you do this already, it's nothing new, but just encouraging it, you know? Um, sometimes people feel like, oh, I'm gonna have a secret conversation over here and I won't let anyone see it. That's okay, just, just don't be scared. It's okay for people to chat among themselves and, you know, do things together. Encourage that. Um, the other thing that I think is one thing that we necessarily, we, we need to get better at is being able to visualize what we do um, to other people who don't necessarily involved in the day-to-day -day activities of what we do. 